Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. Cruising your way on this episode of Off 90. We learn the history behind the dramatic rise and fall of a felonious visionary in southern Minnesota. We meet a Renaissance artist in Owatonna. We chat with some young filmmakers in Rochester. And we take in the fall colors at Forestville State Park. It's all just ahead, Off 90. Hi, I'm Barbara Keith. Thanks for joining me on this episode of Off 90. Here's a story about the rise and fall of a farm and entertainment complex near Leroy, Minnesota. In the early 1900s, a man named Cy Thompson built several state-of-the-art livestock farms, along with an entertainment park. In the early days of the automobile, the park drew thousands of people to its dance hall, hotel, and swimming pool. We take a look at Cy Thompson and where he got the money to build this dreamland. Here's the foundation for the pool. Considering the foundation is about close to 100 years old, and it was a huge swimming pool for that time. This is the deep end. You can see over there how, how large it is. The dance hall was located over there as well, and it was a huge dance hall. I know of a lady in Leroy that talked about coming here for their high school prom. We are still using the same well that they used, and it's wonderful water. I'm Eileen Evans, and I compiled a book about Cy Thompson. Cy Thompson is a man who, in the early 1900s, started a poultry business out just south of Leroy, and uh, it was in Iowa, actually. He uh, started not only having the poultry business, he started to use money lavishly. He was building up this Oakdale Park, and the Oakdale Park became a famous place to go to. People it would come all the way, you know, from Minneapolis and Chicago and all to come to this Oakdale Park, and he had a playground for the kids. He had a campground for the people. He had the pie place. He had restaurants. Out there, kind of, when you came in, in the front yard was a hotel. And that hotel, part of it, was taken and is a, a home down here on the blacktop here. This place across the road was the offices of the poultry company. This is where some of the chickens were kept. Um, for the poultry part of Oakdale Park. And they would estimate in the paper how many were coming, like 10,000 people were coming. And you know, everybody was really, wow, he's really doing good out there, you know, with the poultry, you know. Basically, Cy was a farm boy. Went to work for Hormel Corporation. He worked on the plant floor and uh, Mr. Hormel, not Jay, but George, saw something in Cy and encouraged him to go to business school in Mankato. Cy came back and became the comptroller of the Hormel Corporation. And over the course of about 10 years, he stole well over a million dollars from the Hormels. I uh, work at First State Bank Minnesota here in Leroy. We were established in 1893 and he used our bank to uh, move money from Hormel to his different operations, his farms. Back in the early 1900s, you kept paper. We, the bank, kept everything in chronological order by year. So it was really simple for me to go to dig through all those papers. It's fascinating in how brazen he was. He actually sent letters to our bank on Hormel letterhead saying, here's $600 cash, 
please deposit in Oakdale Farms checking account. It was grand scale kiting. He made money go into what's called in transit. In other words, it wasn't on your books, it wasn't on my books, it was on the way. So we're talking about $1.1 million over the course of 10 years has just been pushed out and is on the way. The process by which Cy was using to kite money was through at least 10 different banks. The checks went by mail. So every single day he had to be at work to get that mail. So for 10 years, he never missed a day of work. Cy did a lot of things with this stolen one million plus dollars. Uh, some of the things Cy did was uh, he, he built farms. Cy built uh, farms that were featured in popular farm magazines. Uh, kind of the uh, uh, forefront of technology. He, he uh, got a $10,000 rooster and they were first class poultry and he won lots of prizes with them, you know, in Madison Square Garden and all. The people at that time loved Cy Thompson so much because he brought, Cy brought cool into the country. Cy Thompson was caught uh, during a normal audit of the books at Hormel. When confronted, Cy admitted and was able to give a pretty close estimate of how much money he had taken from the company. He knew to a penny how much he had embezzled and had never written down one thing. It was all in his head. He, got, he was put in jail. He, he was given 15 years, but he only uh, served nine and a half of them. And uh, then they let him out. If you look at the newspapers at the time, the stories came out, but no one believed that Cy was guilty. The local dealership brought Cy a free car to use while he was out of work. The first year he was in prison, received over 400 letters from people, Lieutenant Governor of California, uh, priests that you know he was acquainted with, tons of businesses, there was a petition here in Leroy of over 300 people signed asking for his immediate pardon. That's what baffles me about the whole thing is here's a guy that was caught and convicted. The people still loved him, you know? Some of them, they would come by train, they'd park the train on the siding. They come from, from all over and they'd come out here to the park during the week and then they'd get back on the train, go back after the weekend to Chicago or wherever it might have been. I still don't believe that that's exactly the full story. I'm not sure exactly what the full story is. I wondered why he had done it and all, and I questioned it for a very long time, thinking that maybe he, at the very end he was going to give it back. Even though he did something wrong, he was such an entrepreneur. You know, I, I keep thinking, what if he'd have done it the right way? You know, could have been the Disneyland of the Midwest or something like that. <laughs> there aren't many hats that Lynette Yencho doesn't wear as an artist. She draws, she paints, she sculpts, she designs websites, she designs costumes. Her creativity is fueled by her love of the irreverent and her cherished dogs. We visited her in her home in Owatonna, which is filled with her creations. I 
remember very distinctly when I was in second grade, my second grade teacher had us do uh, tell stories, or, you know, and I automatically started um, illustrating this, you know, made a little cartoon strip. And I could see my teacher reading it and laughing and smiling and, and it just made me feel so exhilarated that she was excited about my work. My name is Lynette Yencho. I live in Owatonna, Minnesota, and uh, I'm a painter, a sculptor, an illustrator, a commercial artist, a graphic designer, a costume designer, set designer, and anything else that you might want me to be, I can try and be. I started illustrating because um, it was easy to, you know, that was something that took just a pen and a paper or a pencil and I could just draw things. I like to put people and things in ridiculous positions and, um, you know, make a visual satire, uh, you know, in pen and ink. One of my favorite subjects is uh, dogs, of course. You know, uh, I just love happy faces. Frankie is uh, my latest dog um, accomplishment, and she's my little girl. I've got to do a few paintings for the Healing Arts Show, and I thought I would also paint her as uh, the girl with a pearl earring. My art's always been very personal to me. Sometimes they mean something to me that, uh, you know, that probably aren't, it isn't going to mean anything to anyone else, but ends up sometimes they do do, so um, that's okay. Since I do so many different types of mediums, uh, it, one might want to think if it's difficult to move from one medium to the next. I can get stuck in um, a situation in, on a painting and not know where to go from there. And if I just leave it and go do something else, go write some letters or read some mail, or um, look for jobs, I can go back to it and I'll often ha times have an answer. Then you find your answers so much easier when your mind is quiet. My art has always been a part of me so I don't even understand myself why I'm an artist. You know, it, it's just, you just are. Designs, logo designs, computer art, package design. Come on, Photoshop. So many of the most successful people in the world will say, um, oh, who's the guy from Hewlett Packard that said, uh, you know, the way to success is to step up your failure rate. You know, the more times you fail, you will eventually succeed. And so when it comes to painting, I, I think anybody that wants to paint, that you know, really likes to get in there and you know, that, that the sensuousness of watercolor paper and the, you know, just feel it and, and, and imagine it and get into it and, and just, and so what if nothing good comes out of it? You know, throw it out. You know, go, try something else. Have a you know, have a good time at it. And yeah, there's so many things to do. There's there's plenty of room for anybody's art in this world.
Writer Kurt Vonnegut once said, to practice any art, no matter how well or badly, is a way to make your soul grow, so do it. A group of young filmmakers have taken that quote to heart. The members of the Rochester Filmmakers community joined together to achieve one goal, to make movies. We met with the group's founders to talk about what it takes to make movies in southern Minnesota. Marker. Set. Nope. Set. Action. There's a million ways to make movies, and you know, as long as you're creative and passionate about it, you'll get it done. It doesn't matter what you use or where you live. And I think that's the biggest lesson that I've had to take away from, from joining the group. Um, while you're doing that, then we're going to shoot today as you are with your trembling hand and stuff. Okay. So that's... I'm Avai D'Amico. I'm Marty Burnham. And we're the founders of the Rochester Filmmakers Community. You'll get up. As you're coming down here, put this down, come out of the frame, okay. looking at people's work as you're going. Uh, I wanted to make movies, but I knew that I would need more people to make movies with. So I went on the internet and I found that there was another person in Rochester who also wanted to make movies. So I contacted him and it was this guy and we decided to hang some flyers around to see if anyone else shared our interest. I think when we first started the group, we had that curiosity factor where people just showed up and were like, oh, okay, so you're gonna try, well, good luck, and then they disappear. And now we have people that show up every week with new ideas or, you know, uh, again, a stronger dedication to getting things made, a real passion for getting movies made here. It's grown, uh, and it continues to do so. And everybody's getting a little bit more skilled as we go, too. So it's, it's been a good teaching tool um, on a lot of levels, I think. No, it's okay. And then <laughs> you eat it. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then, and then you want to have, have to do so much because you say, you, you can have it, and then... He comes in and he licks it, like, now you're completely grossed out. I'm really impressed with how far we've come in just one year. Yeah, I think we've, we've added quite a few new voices um, and experiences. Um, we have quite a few people who are now dedicated to making movies. Someone will come in and they'll have years of experience behind a camera. Someone will come in and they'll have years of experience writing and they will want to help us with telling better stories from the beginning, making sure that our scripts make sense and are as bulletproof as they can be. Um, other people in the community might have connections with uh, venues where we can have screening events to show our work to the community. Yeah, we've jumped on the radio a couple of times uh, to promote, you know, shoots that we're going to have. Uh, we've had open casting calls uh, to bring in actors, and so we've been in the newspaper a couple of times, you know, and, and then you just put up flyers everywhere, too, uh, and make sure people know. Why can't you be more supportive? I am supportive. I'm, I'm your biggest fan. Don't do this. Well, I mean, we're in a town that's not known for movie making, so there's not a lot of available equipment unless we buy it or, you know, we try to rent it from somewhere. Um, we don't have much of a budget. We're doing micro-budgets at best to make our movies. Um, you know, weather's always a factor here for the better part of the year. Um, and, again, not being L.A. or New York or even Chicago. Um, so, you know, again... Maybe limitation isn't the best word for me to use, uh, as much as just challenge, but it's, it's extra challenge. Um, that's been fun. I can't complain. Good evening, my name is Tanya, and I'll be your... <gasps> Ryan? Oh my god, Ryan! Oh, it's so good to see you! How are you? Tanya, what the hell are you doing? Oh, you know, this and that. 
Yeah, I think we really have to do a lot of work ourselves. that if we were somewhere in like Los Angeles, the work would be done for us as long as we had money. Our first one was a place to be. That one is a tried and true boy meets girl, or in this case, girl meets boy, and you know, love happens. There was one we decided to shoot that was a little darker, um, a little seedier, and that one is Liquor Poker Desire. Uh, takes place in the Doggery, a local bar here. Uh, they're very nice to open up for us and let yes. us shoot there an entire day. Well, the one that we've most recently finished up uh, is called Down in the Park, and it's a comedy drama about this guy who's trying to get over months of isolation and depression after a bad breakup. So it's, it's an interesting story of uh, recovery, basically, of this guy trying to just pull himself out of a rut. And we've got a couple others that we're still working on. So yeah, we'll have a full, full load of films to show pretty soon here. It takes work, so it's a challenge, but it's not impossible. You can make movies in Rochester, you can make movies anywhere. What did I walk into? Do you two know each other? It's... it's complicated. Is it really, Ryan? Out with the old and with the new? Doesn't seem all that complicated to me. Well, our primary goal is to make the best movies we can. I'm just a mostly naked dude who wants to get his flash on. We get a little better every time. I'd say that's a solid goal, yeah. I think, uh, you know, and, and kind of to teach people who are interested. I think that's been a big part of it, too. It's not just the idea of making movies. It's getting these people to understand what it takes to make a movie and then helping people who already have the desire kind of further their own ambitions, their own goals. Um, you know, I don't know if it's really going to go anywhere long term. Like, I don't know that people are going to go out to Hollywood and suddenly make movies, but we might get lucky. Um, and in the meantime, you know, we're doing the things that we love doing and making movies. Dude, I gotta get going. Can you wrap this up? All right, all right. Long story short. And it's, it's very much a team sport. Yeah, along those lines, I mean, it is. It is a community, and if, you know, people are interested in coming down, it's an open community. We don't have any restrictions on who can join up. Uh, if they're interested in filmmaking, they want to see what it's about, you know, good chance that we'll be filming something soon. And they're always welcome to come on down and help us out. Um, hey, I wanted to thank you for all your help today. My portfolio is going to be really strong now. I'm new yet, something special. I had a nice time too. Good. It was kind of late in the season when we decided to go on a fall leaf tour, but we managed to find a piece of heaven at Forestville Mystery Cave State Park in southeast Minnesota. This time we left our fishing pole at home and we skipped the cave tour. Instead, we spent our time wandering the hills and valleys looking for the crisp lushness of autumn.
That's all for this episode. Please help Off 90 meet its financial obligations by becoming a member of KSMQ Public Television. Give us a call at 507-481-2095 or 1-800-658-2539 or sign up online at ksmq.org. Thanks for watching. Join us next time. Off 90. Funding for Off 90 is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota.